They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. We don't need to go populist left or populist right. We don't need to embrace neo-Marxism or neo-fascism, these disastrous movements from the 20th century. Turns out the answer is pretty much our Bill of Rights, our story. Embrace freedom. That's the answer. And if the LP has a purpose, it's not to put people to sleep. It's to wake them up. We're here because we love liberty. And we're here because we hate injustice. We are here to save mankind. We are here to fight. Join us, the Libertarian Party, in perhaps the most exciting, grandest endeavor in history, the restoration of American liberty. Ideas spread, they can't stop them. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Hello and welcome to episode 56 of Decentralized Revolution, a podcast from the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and Mises PAC. I'm Aaron Harris and I'm your host, Today's guest is Sheldon Richman from the Libertarian Institute. Uh, He's been on twice uh, to talk about uh, a couple of his other works and his work at the Libertarian Institute. And I think on one or or both of those uh, appearances, we briefly allude to uh, the fact that uh, Sheldon knows a lot about the history of Palestine and the state of Israel. And uh, a few months ago, I said, Sheldon, we'll have you back on in the spring uh, of 2021 uh, to talk about Coming to Palestine, which is a collection of his works uh, on this issue, on the Israel-Palestine issue from the Libertarian Institute. Um, It's taken from uh, different uh, places that uh, Sheldon has written about this over the last 30 plus years, I think. Uh, I've read it. Uh, It's good. It's a very good short... um, a way to kind of dip your toe in and, and find out a little bit about uh, Israel Palestine. It's not the comprehensive uh, A to Z chronological uh, analysis or history, but uh, if you're a libertarian, if you're an anarcho capitalist and you want to know kind of how to start getting your um, mind around this thing, coming to Palestine is, is a good way to do that. I know that uh, in my transformation to becoming a libertarian, that Uh, foreign policy, and then uh, specifically kind of the Israel-Palestine thing was kind of the last thing that I had uh, some really serious um, uh, misinformation in my head about. I I really did not understand it. I thought I did, uh, but I didn't. So there may be some of you, especially those of you who, like me, came from you know, a a Christian background, a a fairly conservative Christian background, we may be uh, accustomed to one view of the state of Israel that that really, in my opinion, and uh, uh, I think it's more than my opinion, uh, it it really just doesn't line up with the facts. So uh, I encourage you to listen to this episode. I encourage you to go to the show notes page at decentralizedrevolution.com slash 56 to find out uh, how you can get Sheldon's book and uh, also take a look at uh, uh, some links that uh, uh, Sheldon recommended uh, that I post on the show notes page for you to get more uh, informed about this. So uh, I know you will enjoy this episode with Sheldon Richman. Sheldon Richman, welcome back to Decentralized Revolution. Nice to be back. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I think you might be the first three-time guest other than Michael Heiss. So um, uh, congratulations on that. And right. it's, it's no mistake, uh, you're one of my favorite libertarians going back to when you were right. at the at the Cato Institute and I was an intern there in 1996. That's going back a ways. Yeah. Um, and so you had a, a book come out within the last several months at the Libertarian Institute called Coming to Palestine. And I'm going to let you kind of uh, talk about what that is. And then what I wanted to do is uh, kind of uh, mimic a conversation that I had with a friend of mine mm-hmm. recently, who's a sort of non-political libertarian inclined person, uh, but who grew up in the South and kind of didn't know like any of the history of, of Israel, Palestine. Yeah. And then in like 15 minutes, he was like, Oh, I had no idea. So what yeah. I was going to do is kind of play the part 
uh, of him, somebody of goodwill who doesn't maybe know the history um, sure. and, and get into it that way. So first of all, uh, tell us uh, what uh, tell us what we need to know about coming to Palestine. He came out uh, last year, I forget what month exactly, but it's not a year old. And it was actually something, uh, it was 30 years in the making. It's, a, it's more of a, a collection of essays that appeared in different places. Because uh, I used to write for uh, a few publications in the 80s. And, and then, uh, then I wasn't writing so much about it and then came back to it with the Libertarian Institute. So uh, it's the kind of book you don't really need to start at page one and go to the end. It's, the whole thing's probably... I don't know, 200 pages or so. It's not a very intimidating book. I, I try to make it explain things plainly to someone who doesn't know the history. I've often argued with people who will then at some point say to me, well, you know much more of the history than I do. Uh, strangely, they keep arguing. Right. <laughs> uh, so it, it hits lots of particular topics. So you can go through the table of contents and say, uh, okay, let me read about the 67 war, or let me read about the war of independence, or, you know, you can pick your topic and, and uh, jump around really, if you want, it's not a sustained story from beginning to end. I hope that makes it inviting. So that's, and it's available at Amazon. It's a Libertarian Institute book, but it's, it, you can get it at Amazon, both in Kindle and paperback. Yeah, I, I recommend it. I really enjoyed it. I helped yeah. just a tiny bit in the editing process. Uh, Scott had me take a look at it, and mm -hmm. um, I, I just really enjoyed it for for partly for that reason. It's a different way to approach it than like a a standard like chronological history or, or something like that. So yeah. it is something that you don't have to devote. Um, you know, 20 hours uh, to reading one, one, la one question about background before we get into talking about sure. what's going in Israel, Palestine right now. And uh, you know, the historical roots of that, what uh, is your relationship, your history um, in thinking about Israel? What were you taught? And don't, uh, we don't need to get into too much of how you're um, thinking uh, progressed unless, unless you want to, but just where did you start uh, on thinking about Israel? Uh, and I do discuss that in the book because there is a personal side to it for me. Uh, I was brought up uh, in Philadelphia in a uh, Jewish neighborhood uh, to a, a conservative Jewish family, not, not conservative, I don't mean here in the political sense, but, but in the religious sense, which is kind of a the lines are blurred these days, so it's kind of a mid zone between the orthodox, you know, the very observant and the reform, uh, which, uh, yeah, is uh, at least not so outwardly observant or even in their thinking is not, is not as nothing like the orthodox. So it's, a, it's like a middle ground. Uh, and so I was brought up uh, thinking that Israel is one of the most important things. I, you know, went to, you know, regular uh, public school, but also three days a week, spent a couple of hours in what's called Hebrew school, where uh, not only did you learn uh, some Hebrew, preparing for bar mitzvah at age 13, things like that, but we learned a good bit of, uh, we, we learned a good bit about Israel. And I think one of the goals of that was to instill Israel as part of the identity of the, of the students. In other words, they couldn't have. They couldn't think of a Jewish identity without also thinking about Israel at the center. How important it is. Not that we were propagandized about moving to Israel. Lots of you know, most American Jews have no. Uh, over the years, have had no desire to move there. They'd give money and they'd visit. But the idea that they should pick up and leave, uh, that's always been foreign. I think to uh, Jewish Americans, uh, as many Jew, uh, Western uh, Jews. Uh, it's kind of something for, it's sort of a something for unfortunate people, people who were displaced from their homes in Europe during uh, the Nazi period and others that were in, in particular trouble. But, you know, Israel, uh, America has been a, quite a safe place for, uh, for American Jews, just like, uh, for Jews, just, uh, just like uh, Canada has been and, you know, largely uh, Britain and other Western countries. Uh, so, I was a staunch pro-Zionist. Zionist, Zionism is the, is the name of the movement and the philosophy, really, the ideology of the idea that uh, 
uh, the, the territory that we call Israel or previously known as Palestine, and then had other names when you go back to biblical times, ancient times, Judea, Judah, things like that, uh, was a uh, not just a spiritual home uh, of, to uh, to Jews, something to look forward uh, toward and pray about, and the religious thought once the Messiah arrives, you know, you return, that'll be God's message that it's time to go back, but but. To, what Zionism, modern Zionism, beginning of the late 19th century, basically turned that view into was a, a, a political movement and an ideology that literally is the home and that there ought to be a movement to restore, as they would put it, uh, that area. And they debated what exactly constituted the area, but let's say roughly that strip of land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, some of them to go across the Jordan River, some of them to go further north into what's today Lebanon. Uh, some claim the Sinai. I mean, it depended on the, the degree of your Zionism. But that that ought to be somehow, sometimes they were vague about how, turned into a actual Jewish state, not just a homeland, but a, but a political state in the in modern times. Uh, right. Our views as I encountered criticism of, of this view, and particularly as I encountered history that I had never come across before, my, my views began to change. And you're welcome to explore that, I feel like. Sure. So the kind of the, the narrative that most Americans, um, uh, especially sort of American uh, Christians, uh, you know, immigrants from other countries um, may have a, a fuller or different picture, but kind of the narrative is it, it kind of starts with with Hitler, and it's like uh, the Jews were persecuted. Um, this was uh, just a tremendous, uh, tremendously horrible event, which it was, yeah. and there, therefore, never again. We can. Uh, the, the Jews said to themselves, "We can never be fully welcome." anywhere. So to pre prevent this from happening again, we need Zionism. We need to go have our own, have our own Jewish state. And then what we see. So given that backdrop, we see things like the recent uh, over the last few weeks uh, headlines, like, you know, uh, Palestinians fire rockets into Israel and then that, that, the, the uh, killing, you know, however many people are, are hurting how many people. And then it's, uh, the, the headlines going in the other direction, as Scott Horton says, are, you know, 23 dead after Jewish defensive maneuvers or something. So yeah. that what we hear from people, um, e there was even like a, a headline in the Babylon Bee, that satirical paper that says, uh, I, I forget exactly how it was worded, but it was basically implying that, hey, Jews just want to live with not being bombarded with rockets. So yeah. why are you... Um, uh, questioning their right to exist. So that's the context. Given that, what's been going on the last few weeks and, and why is that narrative um, not the whole picture? Right. And of course, you need historical context. If you walk in in the middle of a movie, don't expect to understand the plot and certainly don't be a movie reviewer if you like to get there, you know, way into the story. Uh, yeah, if you were if you thought history began yesterday or last week or two weeks ago, uh, you're going to get a very different view. So you do have to go back, but you don't have to go back to ancient times. That's what some people think, and I think one reason people give up on just trying to decide for themselves and, and just kind of just listen to the dominant voices. Oh, it's an ancient religious controversy conflict, which it really is not. Um, you know, first of all, in ancient times, the Arabs were not in <laughs> in that uh, area. That that doesn't occur to what the seventh century of the Common Era. So that's you know that's a long time, seven hundred <laughs> years after, uh, more than seven hundred years after the biblical period ends. Uh, and it's not essentially religious. It's not a fight between Muslims and Jews. There have been uh, times throughout history where uh, Muslims and Jews lived together side by side 
uh, in relative peace. I mean, certainly compared to Europe, the way the way Jews were treated in Europe, uh, the, uh, the the life in the, the Arab world and the Muslim world was uh, much superior. Uh, and, and there, there are lots of stories and figures you can you can point to. Moses Maimonides, when he uh, uh, was one of you know the one of considered the greatest Jewish philosopher, when he had to leave Spain because there was some problems. After a while, there was pro problems at least uh, in some parts of the that peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula, between the Muslim authorities or at least a couple of Muslim authorities and Jews. He where did he go? He went to Cairo. And then, uh, you know, where they spoke Arabic, where they, they were Arabs. So you don't need to go back that far. I think you really just need to go back to the late 19th century, really. To, to uh, I think that's fairly uh, accurate to do that. Because up till then, there was no interest, there was hardly any interest at all in among Jews in going back to, quote, going back to... Uh, to uh, that region and uh, and 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 trying to reconstitute the ancient the ancient uh, kingdom and uh, and recreate the the the, the uh, temple, very few would want to do that even in the 19th century. So, what was the situation on the ground in Palestine uh, when Zionism started to come up? Because the again the narrative uh, the slogan you hear is what a, a people without a country for a country, yeah. a, a people, a land without a people is how Palestine sure, was, was characterized. Is, is oh, that, yeah. is that true in the late 1800s? There's a phrase. Thank you for reminding me of that phrase where you, that was hammered into us in uh, Hebrew school, a land, uh, yeah, land without a people for a people without a land. It's a very uh, touching idea and get, and given as you, as you pointed out, the, the, uh, the horrible, Things that happened in the 30s and 40s uh, with the Nazis, which you know, which is obviously one of the great crimes of a, a human history, not just that century. Uh, I mean, it was an attempted genocide, no, no doubt about that. Um, uh, that can't help but touch the heartstrings. So you're saying, you, what could be the objection? Uh, but then you're going to get a little, you're going to dig deeper, and it's you don't have to dig that deep. I mean, it's not hard to find these facts. These facts are uh, have not been you know buried and completely out of sight. It was not a land without a people. Uh, people lived continuously. Non-Jews lived con continuously in that that strip of territory uh, from again ancient times on. Certainly from let's you know say the first century onward. And then when, the, and lots of people came in and, and conquered, I mean, you know, the Greeks ruled it, the Romans ruled it. Uh, before that, there's the Assyrians and the, uh, the Babylonians. And so, you, 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 you know, that's a crossroads, that stretch of land is a crossroads between the, in ancient times, the, the big empires that were, uh, you know, one, one would uh, rise and another would fall. And that was a trading uh, crossroads. Lots of people went through there and sometimes they were conquerors and brutal, and sometimes they were just traders who mixed with people. So you get lots of mixture of people. Uh, and um, so there were there were the non-Jewish population has con has a continuous uh, presence. Very and and it's and today's generation are really a mix of kind of all those people, just because people came through and settled and took wives and stuff like that, uh, and and so. Uh, uh, by 19, uh, by the by the 19th century, by by, by uh, let's say 1900, the majority of people there were what we call Palestinian Arabs today. Some mostly Muslims, some Christians, I'm sure some secular. Now there were Jews there; they were a minority. Jews, some Jews did move there over the years, not to try to start a statehood movement, but they did, they wanted to die there. A lot of very religious Jews thought that was the place to die. I mean, very religious Jews believed that when the Messiah comes, the dead were going to rise, and they thought somehow they'd be first in line the closer they were to to, to those uh, holy sites in Israel. I don't mean to make fun of the Orthodox, but I mean they, you know, I don't share those views. By the way, I, you know, I let go of Judaism as a religion as a belief uh, before I let go of Israel. Uh, 
uh, just to put that on the record, there are plenty of people who call themselves Jews but who are atheists, but who are very staunchly pro-Israel, as staunch as any uh, believing uh, uh, Jewish person. Uh, so there were there were people there. They owned the majority of the land. They had uh, occupied, occupied, but in the sense of living and working and farming, uh, by by John Locke's standards, which I as a libertarian uh, cling to. Uh, I think they they count as owners. Uh, there was all there were also there was also a lot of land that was on the record claimed by feudal landlords because when that area before the British. Took it over in after World War One. That's very important, but we don't need to dwell on that. Uh, the, it was ruled by the Ottomans, the Turks, for what, something like four hundred years. And of course, we we know from other places what what rulers do. They give out land to friends and other people they want support of, or things like that, at big plots of land. I don't mean like a little, you know, couple acres in a house. I mean <laughs> lots and lots of land, and then. They have the, these owners, these feudal owners, then have people work on the land and pay rent either in crops or cash. And so a lot, some of the land, I don't, I don't know the percentages, uh, was of that nature. And that's important because later on, some of the Zionist organizations and individuals buy land from absentee landlords, feudal landlords, not Lockean owners, who are now living in Beirut. You know, they're somewhere else. And then they kicked off the people who had been farming and whose families had been farming it for you know generations because that was supposed to be reserved for Jewish labor because when you have a Jewish state, Jews have to have priority. Otherwise, you know, what's a Jewish state? So what was the interactions? Explain how um, uh, the Zionist movement started to get people to, uh, for the first time in much greater numbers, say, hey, we want to go build yeah. a life in Israel. Explain how that happened and how the interactions between the newly arrived Zionists and the, the people who were working the land and, and already there. The idea was a flop until about 1945, uh, which, which gave it a whole distorted, uh, gave it a whole distorted image. Uh, the, 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 most Jews were not even European Jews, even Jews who were living under unfortunate circumstances in, say, Eastern Europe, you know, getting toward Russia, uh, didn't rush to Palestine. They may want to live in the desert, an undeveloped place. American Jews weren't much interested. The reform movement, which really gets going in the United States earlier in the 19th century, when they begin to hear about this idea, in fact, their founding document uh, since, what is it, the Pittsburgh Platform, I think, declares that we do not regard ourselves as being in exile. We are Americans. We're Jewish Americans. Jews, Judaism is our religion. Our nationality is, is American. We're citizens of the United States. We don't have another country, which means they were knocking the, you know, knocking out the criticism of any, any kind of, a, or the accusation of any kind of dual loyalty, which has, has dogged Jews since the state was formed. They said, we are Americans. Our religion happens to be Judaism. No, they were reformed, so they weren't. Uh, but then we're, on the other side, you had the Orthodox, who's, who also were against it, against the statehood movement, because they said, who are these Eastern European counterfeit Jews, like Ben-Gurion or Herzl, who were, they were atheists. They were totally secular. They weren't Jewish. Uh, Herzl had a, had a uh, Christmas tree in his house. He didn't circumcise his son. Uh, they were totally uh, secularized. Uh, but then they said, who are these people to lead us to the promised land, to the holy the holy land? That's for God and his chosen appointee, the Messiah. And these guys, you know, aren't it. Uh, so they reject it. Uh, but they, you know, they managed to start to attract some people, a minority, but enough to get a political movement going. They held conferences and started promoting the idea. And then they get a big break during World War I, before America is in the war, they, the, the British Zionists, which are very active, Chaim Weizmann is one of the leaders. He ends up becoming the first president of Israel. They convinced the British government to issue a, a declaration. It's known as the Balfour Declaration, very famous, 1918, I guess, or 17, that says His Majesty's government looks with favor on the, the founding of a, these aren't the exact words, of a, of a, of a Jewish homeland 
in Palestine. So it's a little vague. They purposely went for vague language. It doesn't say a state. It was a homeland in. It doesn't say all of it. You know, they left all that, which was fine with the Zionist movement because they figured, we didn't have, don't, don't worry. We don't need to show all our, our, uh, our cards right away. And plus, they were, there were some pragmatists saying, let's get what we can get right now and worry about more later. So that some of them, you know, didn't want to go for the whole thing right away figuring they wouldn't get it but that gave a big boost there were already supporters of israel or the founding of a state in america and and i think the hope of the of the british was if we issue this declaration then uh, those america they had an inflated view of the influence of american jews they thought american jews will get the u.s government into the war because at that time it wasn't certain that you yeah. know you know that england was going to win that war france was already in uh, trouble. It was, it was uh, you know, you had this uh, 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 trench warfare. Everybody's sort of basically stuck in place. They made a little progress and then they get thrown back. You know, it was not a sure thing that England was going to beat uh, uh, Germany and Austria. Uh, and and they, the other thing they did was promise the Arabs independence if they revolted against the Turks. If you've seen the, the movie Lawrence of Arabia, which may not be 100%, probably not 100% accurate, I think I can say with certainty. Nevertheless, the broad outline is there, is, is, is in that movie. Uh, they, told the, they told the Arabs, and the Arabs have wanted independence for a long time, uh, overthrow the Turks, give the Turks all kinds of trouble, which will help our war effort. They were part of the Axis powers the, uh, you know, the, with Germany and Austria. And uh, help us out, and we'll, uh, we'll give you independence. Uh, meanwhile, Balfour is saying, and you can find the quote online, something like, there wasn't a single promise we made to the Arabs that we didn't intend to break. That's basically a verbatim quote from. So uh, you can see how the momentum is, is going, but it's still not a huge thing. Uh, uh, after, after World War I, the League of Nations recognizes Britain's basically a protector, protector of status over Palestine. It was known as a mandate, right? It was, it was kind of a little bit of window dressing on the old colony idea. And they did that with the states around the Middle East. Uh, France or England kind of got in charge. It was given, you know, it was their own. They just got, the league ratified what they already wanted, right? France would have uh, basically control of uh, Syria and Lebanon, and uh, England would get uh, Iraq and uh, Transjordan, which is today's Jordan, and, and then, and, but in a, in a much more uh, colonial uh, looking way, England would control uh, a Palestine. Uh, so this, this, is, this is going on. Then, then, okay, then you get World War II, which of course is a consequence of World War I, but that's a different subject. You wouldn't have World War II if you didn't have World War I and the, and the, peace, the peace treaty, uh, the Versailles, yeah treaty. Uh, and it enables World War, it, was, it enables the Zionist project to be transformed in terms of public relations into a refugee project. Because the other one wasn't really carrying the day with most Jews about uh, this is a state, this is, a, this is, some people believe all Jews should go there. Uh, by the way, some non-Jews thought all Jews should go there. I wonder about their motives. I mean, uh, I think the original Zionist idea was floated in the mid 19th century by by British uh, Christians. <laughs> yes. So some of them may have thought, "Hey, this is convenient. We we get the Jews to decide they want to go to Israel, but we all or you know Palestine, but also we get them out of we get them out of England." <laughs> so I'd be a little suspicious about that. Uh, but there were there were Jewish Zionists who thought, "No, all Jews should go there because, like you said." And it was a dangerous thing to say because it, it kind of ratified the, the Nazi view. Jews are aliens everywhere except their own homeland back in, you know, Palestine or what they want to call it, Israel. Uh, that you know they would even agree. I mean, Herzl sucks up to dictators uh, that uh, both the Turks and the and the, uh, and, the uh, and others saying we agree with you. We don't belong here. We're parasites. I mean, they said terrible things, some worse than, than Herzl said. Uh, we agree. No, you know, did they mean it or did they, uh, were they just sucking up, hoping they can get help? I don't know. I can't read their minds. But the point is they reinforced, they kind of ratified the anti-Semitic view 
that uh, the Jews were never were going to be a alien presence anywhere but that strip of land. So you better get behind us and help us set this place up. Well, there were lots of other Jews who were shouting from the rooftops, "Stop saying that!" First of all, you're endangering Jews who are, you know, doing pretty well in America and Canada and uh, Australia and you know uh, South Africa and other places because they. Jews lived all over the place. Anyway, it worked. And, the, and as we know, the UN, the General Assembly in 1947, recommended that, that that land be divided. But it's very important to point out, and Jeremy Har Hammond, Jeremy R. Hammond, who's written great stuff about this, you can find it online, uh, points out, and people don't generally know it, the UN did not partition Palestine into a Palestinian Arab state and Arab state and a, and a, and a Jewish state because, because it has no power in its bylaws to partition territory, uh, especially if it's against the wishes of the majority of the people living there and the Arabs were the majority. Uh, what, the, what the General Assembly did was recommend partition to the General Assembly and also to England, which was winding down Britain, which was winding down its mandate status because things were getting violent there. There was there was Jewish terrorism against the Brits. Uh, Arabs also had revolted against the British rule there. And so they were washing their hands of it. They came out of the war, you know, fairly broke and exhausted. And they said, turned it over to UN. We're getting out in, you know, a year. They gave them a deadline. We're getting out in a year, so you, you handle this. Uh, so there was a recommendation. The General Assembly never acted on. There was even a, some people were calling for a reconsideration and there were various commissions who said, yeah, this isn't going to work. We need to reconsider this. But in 1948, a year later, Israel, I mean, the people who then became the leaders of Israel unilaterally declared independence and they cited as their authority this resolution, 181, of the General Assembly, which was merely a recommendation. Mm -hmm. But they said, we are, we are now independent. So they declare themselves a state, and I don't. I don't know if some of this started happening before um, Israel declared independence, but um, uh, you've recommended to me uh, some uh, different books that that kind of outline this, and I think you refer to it in uh, uh, different places in coming to Palestine. That uh, these people, many of whom had just been subject to. Um, uh, you know, an attempted genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing, you know, you can't live in this area, you have to go live in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Those people and their associates kind of started doing the same thing to the people who were living in Palestine. Is that correct? Yes, that actually goes back on a smaller scale to the early 20th century, because like I said, large tracts of land were being bought from these feudal landlords who weren't even on the scene. Uh, they were never sort of locky in owners, right? They never mixed their labor with the land. They got it from the Sultan uh, and, or some local official, and then they employed labor on it, Arab, Arab labor, what we call Palestinian, but the, meaning Arabs, because the Jews back then were called Palestinians too in, that, in those very early days before, the, before this conflict uh, came up. And, and so they would, there were the people that took control of that land believed that this was uh, needed to be cleansed, purified. They, they used the, the Hebrew word for purified and redeemed. It, it, in other words, Jew, it should be Jewish labor. And, and sometimes they violated that when they needed the, the menial labor, you know, the, the, the manual labor. They would, and if they couldn't find enough Jews because Jews weren't flocking there, they would, they would uh, you know, hire Arabs. But um, the Arabs who had lived there for generations, in most cases, basically had were told they had to leave. They weren't killed, they weren't, uh, but they were told to leave. And you know, Herzl, there's a famous line in Herzl's diary about we're going to we'll spirit the penniless peasant, you know, population across the border. Uh, and he said he said something like, "We'll secure them employment over there across the border." In other words, outside of <laughs> the territory they wanted, which was you know very magnanimous of them. Uh, as time went on, though, we had more Arabs being pressured to leave. And as when 47, 48 comes along, even before the war, the war that occurs, the so-called War of Independence, um, 
then you have basically terrorist groups. You have militias. It's still pre-Israel, so they're not like an organized, a formal military. You have Haganah, you have the Stern Gang, you have the Irgun. These are uh, undistinguishable from Zionist, sorry, from terrorist organizations. They they would uh, they killed people. They killed uh, civilians. They killed civilian British officials. You know, they bombed the King, the famous King David Hotel in uh, Jerusalem and destroyed part of it and, and killed a, a bunch of, uh, you know, just sort of government workers. Uh, the idea was to first drive the uh, British out and then drive uh, as many uh, Arabs out. And this was uh, known as, there was a Plan D or in Hebrew Plan Dalit, you can read about in lots of books, uh, which was a, uh, which was a, uh, uh, a self-conscious plan to get rid one way or another of as many Arabs as you can. And as Benny Morris, who's a right-wing historian, but a, but a rather honest one in, uh, in, uh, in Israel, has pointed out, what do you expect of a, if you're trying to f form a Jewish state, what would you expect? You can't have an Arab majority. Um, even the partition, most of the land of the Jewish part was still majority owned by Arabs. And the population, if you count the Bedouin, you know, who are semi-nomadic, they have some more permanent settlements, but they also do some moving. And so they, a lot of times they don't get counted when people say, but the Jews, Jews would have been the majority, a slight majority in the Jewish part of the partition. But if you count the Bedouin, they're not, they wouldn't be. Overall, Jews got 45% uh, of the land on the partition plan, and Arabs got 45% which is kind of a strange division. But it, and if you look at the map, which you can find online, it's very gerrymandered. Uh, but neither state is, can, is a bunch of contiguous, you know, a lot of contiguous territory. It's different sections that are maybe linked by, by a road or some narrow strip. It's, I mean, you can tell some creative mind, maybe a mad creative mind, came up with this really weird configuration to try to get as much, uh, you know, try to work a Jewish majority or something close to it in the Jewish part. But in every district, even in the Jewish parts, Arabs own most of the land. By 1948 or seven, uh, Jews had bought, even if you count those feudal purchases, only 7%, a little bit less, 7% of all that, that land, that territory from the Mediterranean Sea to, to the Jordan River. Uh, but it, oops, sorry, go ahead. No, that, so what, uh, given the fact that uh, um, uh, they didn't buy it all and that the uh, the land was was occupied by Arabs. Um, uh, what what then? Plan D. Uh, what then actually happened? Sometimes you see the claim that that the Arabs just kind of willingly left, and the and the um, Israelis came in and just inhabited abandoned places. Uh, um, so w what actually happened? Well, uh, by the end of that war the self-proclaimed state of Israel now had, what is it, 78% uh, of the, that entire territory, again, only counting from the sea to the, uh, to the river and uh, up to the line where we think of Lebanon, you know, the, the, the international border for Lebanon. Uh, uh, so it had gone from 55 to 78. Uh, so it, it had everything but the West Bank, which includes East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, uh, and and that's it. That's it. Uh, it. It had it had all of that. I mean, there's some place up near the Golan Heights in, near Syria where there, uh, 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 although they don't they don't take that until '67. So I'm getting ahead. Um, anyway, it's right. There is a war. Now, what happens first? There, first, there's, there is something like a war against the Palestinians, the the Arabs who were living in uh in in that territory with these three or more militias terrorist militias who uh terrorized people terrorized villages uh not in every case sometimes a local leader would realize okay some village was uh has has had uh, you know friendly relations for a long time with the uh, jews in the area and then so it all, there could be discretion on the part of some lo local uh, military and political uh, leaders, so it's not uniform, but but by the end of that war, seven hundred fifty thousand Palestinians are driven from their homes. 
and have gone to the West Bank or uh, uh, Gaza Strip or you know, or left all to, left altogether. Uh, but it wasn't just that they were afraid. I mean, the old myth used to be that was debunked long ago was that the Arabs were the Arabs outside of Israel were broadcasting to the Arabs: "Leave your homes." So you don't get hurt in the crossfire. You can return after we win. That's I grew up learning that. That was actually debunked like in the 50s. I mean, it was, uh, I don't even hear people say that anymore. It's just not true. And uh, there were some outright massacres. I mean, the most famous is in a, in a village called Deir Yassin, near, not far from Jerusalem, in April of 1948. This is before... There's an, act, an, uh, there's an actual war involving outside Arab countries where a hundred or more people are just massacred. And then that, that Dir Yassin name, word spread, what had happened there. And then they, that word was used by the militia to scare other people out of their homes. So in other words, you want to suffer their fate? Stay here. So penny, lots of people left, you could say voluntarily, but they left because of, they were terrorized. And those people have a right to, you know, under international law and under, I would say, libertarian principles, have a right to return to their homes, even, even if they got scared to flee their homes. You're not obligated to just stay in your home if you think you, you and your family are going to die. Sometimes you hear um, from people, even people with libertarian leanings, uh, like Ayn Rand, uh, kind of her attitude was, hey, these Palestinians are... Um, uh, uh, just not as advanced. The Jews are cultured. They're, they're, uh, smart Westerners. Uh, you also hear the claim that, uh, uh, you know, it, the Palestinians are, are Islamic extremists who hate the West and hate freedom and hate that women can wear skirts at their knee and, uh, the, the, and drink alcohol and things like that. So even though, again, I'm being the uh, devil's advocate yeah. or whatever, uh, even though there were some, uh, yeah, there were some uh, uh, things that we maybe shouldn't have done in the way of an ethnic cleansing, what the Palestinians are now, um, they're conducting terrorism. They want to wipe Israel out and kill all the Jews. So, mm -hmm. Even even if I grant your what you've said so far, uh, in order to defend themselves and to keep another Holocaust from happening, they need to do what they're doing uh, to the current uh, population who are uh, just unreasonable. So what about that argument and what is the actual legal status of, of Palestinians now uh, in Israel, West yeah. Bank, Gaza? Okay, well, I'll pack into that. I mean, Rand didn't know what she was talking about, on, uh, certainly on this issue. Uh, the Palestinian society, the Arab, the Arab Palestinian society pre-48 uh, was, was diverse. You had westernized uh, uh, Arabs, and you had, uh, uh, just like it was religiously uh, uh, diverse, you had people who were more modern and, and people who were more orthodox, just like with the Jews. Uh, you can find uh, many documentaries on YouTube about what pa Jerusalem and Palestine looked like in the 19th century or pre-48, and you'll be amazed. You'll see schools with uh, school girls and, and uh, you know, boys looking like Westerners, I mean, in their, in their clothes. So this idea that it was some sparsely populated, very primitive, you know, people walking around, wandering around with camels, uh, and barely, you know, really living is, is just nonsense. Yeah, there were Bedouins too. There was, there was, like I said, great diversity. Uh, people were not permitted to return to their homes after things settled down. You know, 1949, there's armistice. Uh, some Arab governments got into the fight belatedly and very reluctantly in 48 because I think a lot of the populations were even demanding it because they were aware that Palestinian Arabs were being driven from their homes. They heard, they would hear the stories and, you know, that, that kind of thing spreads like wildfire. And they were aware of it. Plus they were probably meeting some refugees who were telling them what was going on. Uh, it wasn't anti-Semitism. It was, a, it was a, a, a horrified reaction at hearing that people are being driven from their homes that they and their families have lived in 
uh, for generations. Uh, Jordan, which was the had the, the best developed and best trained army, and it even had British supervision and had British officers as part of it, had a secret deal with the uh, soon to be Israeli government, uh, Ben Gurion and, uh, and the other officials, to carve up the territory because Jordan didn't want an independent Palestinian state either. The king of Jordan, who was from the, the very prominent Hashemite family, he wanted to be the ruler basically of all Arabs. He aspired to be the pan-Arab ruler. So he thought, I don't want an independent Palestinian state. So he cuts a deal in secret negotiations. There's a book about this by uh, Avi Shlaim, who teaches in England, uh, called uh, Collusion Across the, uh, the Jordan, or I think he later named it the politics of partition. Uh, and so there was cooperation between the king of Jordan and the, who would, you know, those who would become the heads of the Israeli government to make sure there is no Palestinian state. Now, they didn't agree about what should happen to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, under the so-called partition recommendation, was to be an international city, not administered by either the Palestinian state or the Jewish state. That, that was going to be an open international city where everybody's going to have access. I mean, that was the language used. But uh, neither uh, neither Jordan nor Israel wanted that to happen. Uh, so what you have is, uh, you asked about the, what's going on today, and, sh and if you only look at it as the Israelis are being subject to terrorism and rockets, uh, you know, why shouldn't they be able to do something? Well, if you just look at it out of context, it looks like, yeah, people shouldn't tolerate being attacked by rockets. But if... It, but the Israeli government has not, despite some of its statements uh, and kind of bogus concessions over many years, has never wanted there to be a Palestinian state. Uh, most prominent Israeli and Israeli leaders have wanted annexation of the West Bank, certainly the West Bank, and the unification of Jerusalem, making it the capital solely of uh, of Israel, which of course Trump uh, went along with in, uh, a couple of years ago by moving the embassy, uh, even though the world hasn't recognized, hasn't recognized that. And uh, in other words, Israel has not shown any willingness to talk about uh, refugees, the ones that were kicked out of their homes and have had no ability to come, uh, come back to their homes. On the other hand, Israel claims that Jews who were kicked out of East Jerusalem when it was under Transjordan's or Jordan's uh, control have a right to those homes, even though uh, well, they, they may not even be the ones who were kicked out, but any Jew basically can have a, have, has a better right to a home that Jews once lived in than the Palestinians who have been living in there, you know, living there for decades. Uh, so there's a one-way right of return, right? Jews have a right of return, quote, return, because they may not literally be returning. Arabs... Palestinians have, you know, nothing, not, nothing like that. Uh, so here's, here's the, to me, the bottom line. When you rule people with an iron hand and show no real good faith effort to relieve their situation and bring about their, their having full rights, what would you expect except that the most violent prone types will rise to the top because other people will just be hopeless the, the, the violent ones will say, look, we tried everything else. Negotiation doesn't work. Yeah. And, and so, you, you know, I'm bring, this brings to mind Hamas, right? People say, but Hamas, even if there's some signs of cooperation on the part of the, uh, the old uh, Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, some people say, yeah, but what about Hamas? You can't deal with Hamas. But there wouldn't be Hamas, or Hamas wouldn't be certainly as prominent if this, these problems had been addressed in a good faith way with real steps. Uh, decades ago. In fact, the, in fact, Israel it, at least tacitly encouraged the development of Hamas for two reasons. Number one, it's a, it is a religious fundamentalist organization. It's kind of right-wing Muslim. The PLO was always a secular organization. Yaraf, Yasser Arafat was not a religious fanatic. He was a secular political operative who at one point, at one point in the late 80s then renounced terrorism, and I'm not defending their, uh, the killing of innocent people, just going after civilians. I don't defend that with Hamas or, or anybody. Uh, but, he, but he did renounce it and say, okay, look, we'll take the 22%. And that's a huge concession. They never get much credit for, for that concession. Uh, Hamas, Hamas then rises with uh, at least uh, Israel looking the other way, uh, especially in the Gaza Strip. And uh, 
it's religious and it it, 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 does, it hasn't renounced terrorism. So when the PLO turned to diplomacy, Hamas then is quietly encouraged because it, it keeps the argument alive by the Israelis and Netanyahu types, who may be on his way out, by the way. Uh, what can we do? We can't do, how can we deal with Hamas? How do you deal with people who fire rockets at you? They wouldn't be firing rockets. You know where they fire rockets to so often? A southern village that, that many people who live in Gaza were driven out of, at least, or their parents were driven out of. They are refugees. Gaza is mostly refugees. I think three quarters are refugees who lived in Israel. But that is, 1947-48, the Zionists wiped out four, at least 400 villages, uh, Palestinian villages, and paved them over and turned them into uh, uh, Israeli, uh, you know, settlements and towns. That's what's going on today. And so to blame Hamas is ridiculous. Uh, what, do you, what do you do? What have you left to people? If, you're, if they're stuck in an open air prison, which which it is, they can't leave Gaza, and they can't goods can't even come in without permission from Israel, air, sea, and land access totally controlled by Israel. I mean, there may not be Israelis inside Gaza because they got out in what 2005. So you often hear Israel's defenders say, "The Israelis withdrew. It's not an occupied territory anymore." And look what happened. We get rockets. <laughs> yeah, but that's like saying the pri the prison guards aren't in the prison anymore. They're just all around the prison and nothing gets, nothing and nobody gets in or out without the prison guard's permission. To call that not occupied any longer is, that's a lie. That's just misleading. That's a lie. Yeah. We're, we're right up against the, the amount of time that, that, uh, right. uh, I had, uh, uh, that you, that you had today. One uh, very last question, um, and then I'm going to get some information from you offline, uh, okay. links to put on the show notes page of further resources, further reading. Sure. Um, if you were, let's say, um, uh, I, I know you probably w would never want to be this, but let's say you were a diplomat in the United States and but a libertarian and that you were sent to go start talking in palestine what's the i know you can't get into all the details but what's the principle a libertarian should follow in talking about the issues on the ground right now well yeah as a libertarian and of course i don't think anybody there is going to exactly care what, what i say but as a libertarian there's no alternative to equal rights for everybody. And look, if there are property claims, and I have no doubt there are, that some particular Jews or families can make to a particular house or property, we know that there are many more property claims that Palestinians can make. I mean, there are Palestinians today who still have in their pockets keys to homes. They or their parents were driven out of in 47, 48, or, or after 67, when there was more refu refugees were created. So the same rights apply to all people. That's the bedrock libertarian principle, right? It doesn't matter. Your religion doesn't matter. You're so, your alleged ethnicity. If you're a human individual, um, you have rights. And, uh, and that includes the right to, uh, you know, property uh, and land and a house if you've honestly acquired it. And all, all disputes ought to be looked at and people need to approach it in good faith. But of course, that's not gonna be accepted because it threatens the hardliners really on both sides, but it certainly goes against the idea that there needs to be a Jewish majority in order for there to be a Jewish state. And uh, right. I don't think a Jewish state really can pass libertarian muster. Yeah, I, 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 that's my basic thing is that these are states and that they, by definition, violate rights. And as libertarians, we should always look at things from a propertarian uh, uh, point of view. And it, it, it would be a nightmare sorting out all those, those claims, but any honest society or any honest attempt to bring resolution would have to start there for, as a libertarian. But um, I, I appreciate all the time that you've, you've given me. Uh, I will hit you up uh, through email for some uh, resources. You mentioned a couple of documentaries on YouTube and uh, you've already recommended to me a few books about uh, this that, that I'll include, but we'll get more information from you um, on the show notes page. And uh, 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 so 
people can get, get further into this and, uh, coming to Palestine. I recommend that that's a good way to start, uh, getting into this, your book for the libertarian Institute. I'll have a link to that. And, uh, so Sheldon Richmond, thanks for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure. I enjoyed it and, uh, look forward to doing it again sometime. There you have it. I'd like to thank Sheldon Richmond for his time and wisdom again on here on decentralized revolution and, of course, for his writing on this critical issue over the last few decades. Uh, and, and Sheldon's written just a bunch about a bunch of stuff over the years. So just Google Sheldon Richmond uh, after you go to the show notes page at decentralizedrevolution.com slash 56. Uh, Coming to Palestine, uh, the book uh, by Sheldon is linked to there as well as some other links that Sheldon recommended. Thanks to Dave versus Goliath for all the music you hear on Decentralized Revolution. And thanks to everyone who subscribes to our email list and gives to Mises Pack at TakeHumanAction.com and everyone who shares, rates, reviews, and subscribes to Decentralized Revolution. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.